So hello everybody and good afternoon. Here's Kilian Gross speaking from the AI Alliance um, uh, conference today on artificial intelligence. Uh, we are here kicking off with the breakout session on governance, which is of course a very important topic. So for all those who are here, I'm very happy that you joined this breakout session because we have strong competition with other very interesting breakout sessions. And for those who still want to join, I will do of course an, a bit of advertising now to show you how important the topic is. Uh, we just had the international session and I think it links very well because Cédric O, the Secretary of State from France, uh, reinforced at two points in his remarks the importance of enforcement because he said at two occasions, whatever we do, it does not make any sense if we don't have um, a real enforcement of these rules because otherwise rules will remain on paper. And I think that is I think, the key topic of what we want to talk about now. How will these future rules be applied? Are they well applicable? Are they difficult to apply? Uh, will this cause trouble to apply them? And what can we do about them uh, in order to, to help to make sure that we can well apply these rules? Um, I'm very happy because I don't have to discuss this or to present this alone, but I have very distinguished speakers with me today um, who are experts in their field and then give us their dif the different views. So I will briefly introduce you to all of them, even if each of them would, of course, deserve much more attention and much more um, detail. So with me is uh, with uh, Thomas Zerdig, head of unit at the European um, uh, Data Protection Supervisor, a distinguished expert on data protection who worked before in the uh, cabinet of first vice President Timmermans. He was responsible there for the rule of law and fundamental rights, including the data protection uh, legislation. And he was very much involved in his previous function in DG Just, um, in the elaboration of the general data protection regulation and on the police directive. So and we, a true expert on data protection, but as well on enforcement because he works at a body with, who has the task to enforce the rules vis-a-vis -vis the European institutions. We then have with us, um, and the order I put is purely arbitrarily and does not, uh, does not indicate by no means any appreciation. We have with us Abtin Rath, who has 13 years of professional experience in biomedical electric engineering and who is an expert at TÜV Süd, which is a notified body. And he will bring us the perspective of a notified body. Also of these organizations, these uh, mechanisms we would like to use in order to really check and undergo the ex ante conformity assessment. And he has this experience, so he will be able to tell us because he works on very um, advanced technologies uh, with a focus on software, cybersecurity, and artificial intelligence, and in particular medical imaging, um, where he has as well worked on a number of international standards. So he's a manager there at TÜV Süd, and he will certainly give us uh, the insight what the notified body needs and if our requirements are sufficiently operational or not. Then we have with us uh, um, as, uh, Isabel Schömann, who is now um, a confederal secretary of the European Trade Union Confederation, just elected in just in May 2019. And she heads the ETOC policy on worker participation, uh, industrial policy and company law, and an, a number of other fields like competition, labor, internal market. And she is uh, not only an, um, a distinguished expert on labor law and labor issues, but she has as well a deep insight in the European um, Union regulatory affairs because she was uh, an advisor to our regulatory scrutiny board for a number of years. So she's very well familiar with EU legislation and the difficulties of EU legislation. Uh, and before she did so, she was a researcher at the European Trade Union Institute. We then have uh, Mariana Madureira. She's a coordinator at the Medical Device Authority in Portugal, and she will bring the perspective of the public administration into this debate because she would be what we would call in, in, in our regulation, in our draft, of course, uh, the notifying authority or the surveillance authority, so the public side of things. She coordinates here the, the medical device sector at Infamed, the National Authority of Medicines and Health Products in Portugal, and she has more than 17 years of experience in the regulatory area of medical devices. And it's not by coincidence that we have this Abtin Mariana too. Uh, colleagues from the medical who have particular expertise in this medical area because medical devices are very advanced in technology and there we have for instance in the um, medical device regulation we have already software as a product so something which is very similar to what we plan to do in um, the AI regulation and last but not least we have Daniel Abu with us who is the uh, the head 
of the German Association for Artificial Intelligence um, and who was a founder of the AI Hub Europe before. He's a trained journalist by origin and he had uh, he, hold, uh, he held a number of very um, important speaking positions. So for the Secretary of State Nussbaum or for the, uh, he was a second speaker for the Minister President Kretschmann in Baden-Württemberg. So he's a journalist by origin, but now represents the, um, a, you, the German AI um, uh, undertakings. He will bring in uh, hopefully the perspective of the user, those who will be then subject to the new rules and who hopefully will not complain, but benefit from these rules. Um, I see him smiling. He's not yet convinced, but he has not seen our presentation. Uh, so we will, <laughs> with all these experts, we will try to, to, to shed a bit of light on the different aspects. And I, um, even if I promise not to speak too much, I thought I will start with a short presentation so that everybody is really fully understanding what we are talking about, because we are a bit of, um, otherwise this may be a bit um, complex for each of you to understand the different technical terms we may use in the following discussion. I will promise to keep this very, very short. So um, I first start with a little housekeeping remark. We will, after two rounds of questions, we will open the floor to the audience. So you can all in the audience, you can join in and um, start to pose questions. You should do this via Slido. You can here, you can uh, scan the QR code, select day one, breakout session governance, and then you can ask your question or you go to uh, the app from Slido, you enter um, hashtag AI high level conference, HLC, you select again day one and you ask your question. We will hopefully get a lot of questions. We're very grateful. We will try to raise as many. I cannot promise that we will raise all of them, but we will um, try to involve like this, the audience in particular in the second half of this discussion. Um, just a few words on the, um, on the AI regulation, uh, on the governance part of, of things here. I will try to this like this because then you can all see my slide, hopefully. Here you see, um, I just presented in a, in a short way what will be on national level and what will be done on European level um, in the future AI regulation. And as we say, the key role of implementation will be on the national level because here will be the competent authorities, which are now today presented by Mariana, who will then overlook the, um, and oversee the notification process. And there will be the notified bodies who really will do the checks on the ground. And they will have as well the power to impose penalties in case of violations of the regulation. That will be really the bulk of the implementation of the rules. Nevertheless, we will have clear structures on European level, at least according to our proposal, in order to ensure a uniform application and implementation of our rules throughout the European Union. And here we foresee an artificial intelligence board where the members of the different national administrations will come together. The commission will act as a secretariat and we have this here with an asterisk because you will not find it in the regulation, but we think about an expert group where we would then have representatives from civil society, uh, um, which where we could collect the different views. So now let's zoom a little bit deeper in what happens on which level. So you have seen there are two different sides of this coin. There is a European level and there is this national level. On the national level, we will here, as you can see, we will have the member states will designate first the national competent authority who should overlook the system. And then there will be a national supervisory authority, which be the one single contact point, the one authority on top of all the other authorities, because there may be different net, um, competent authorities in different areas. And uh, this will split into a notifying authority and a market surveillance authority. And the national supervisory authority, so the one authority overlooking the national systems, they will send their chair to the European AI board so that in the European AI board, all the national administrations will be united and um, represented. And we will have one group where there will as well be the EDPS, where we will see all representatives from the national supervisory authorities. And these supervisory authorities should control their national system on both sides, namely the notifying authorities and the who will overlook the ex-ante and the market surveillance authorities. Uh, here you can zoom a little bit deeper in the national supervisory authorities. We have one rule, we don't prescribe, with a few exceptions, we don't really prescribe who should this be in the member state, but we prescribe that they must be um, provided with sufficient financial and human resources. So it's key for us that these bodies are sufficiently strong in order to fulfill their tasks. 
We don't give a figure, but we pre prescribe a qualitative benchmark in the uh, draft regulation so that they should be sufficiently equipped to do their task. They have, under their auspices, they will have the notifying authorities, which designate and monitors notified bodies. So they basically certify the bodies, like the TRIF could be one of them, who would then practically do the checks. And below on the left-hand side, you see then the notified bodies who are independent third parties and who perform then this ex ante conformity assessment of high risk systems in particular for the products, but partially as well for the self-standing AI systems. This is the ex ante part. And then we have the ex post part where we have the market surveillance authorities who carry out market surveillance authorities um, activities. And we have made in the regulation, the whole market surveillance regulation applicable. They will provide access to training and validation and testing data sets used by the provider. And that's very important, this market surveillance authorities will grant access for other public bodies who may need access to the um, to this testing data to this data in order to fulfill their task, for instance, under fundamental rights obligations. So if an equality body has a case in front of it, he or she may turn to the market surveillance authority in order to get access to data sets and in order to be able to fulfill their tasks. And of course, the providers of the high-risk AI systems will be subject to all these rules. And then at the European level, to stop, and this is in the last um, slide before we, we kick off the discussion, we will have, as I said, we will have the European AI board. There will be three groups. There will be the national supervisory authorities, which will be the, uh, the unique central point for the uh, implementation of the regulation in each member state. There will be the European Data Protection Authority, so the authority which is today represented by Thomas, and there will be the uh, representative of the European Commission who will act and the Commission will act, as we said, as a secretariat for the day-to-day -day business and prepare and follow up. Uh, the board as such has as a task to facilitate the consistent um, application of the legal framework. They should contribute to market monitoring. They should collect and share best practices. They should contribute to standard development and AI policy. And of course, they should provide advice on all AI issues. We, the Commission will, uh, in addition, set up a new database where we will have a register of high-risk AI systems. And then last but not least, the system may be completed by an independent expert group, which will may provide um, technical and scientific advice to the commission and will in particular play a role uh, in the foreseen update of the regulatory instrument, namely if the annexes, for instance, would need to be updated in order to be brought in line with new developments. So this was in a very rough way, um, the, uh, the regulatory framework on, on the governance. I hope now that I did not um, confuse you, but that you have a, a clear overview. And um, before we, um, perhaps after you have digested this is a little bit, I may then just start with my, my first two of introductory questions. And I would like to talk, uh, to turn to, to Thomas from the European Data Protection Supervisory um, Supervisor. Um, what are your views on the AI Act and how the EDPS is involved in its implementation? And I would particularly, of course, be happy if you refer a bit to your experience, which you have from the GDPR. Thomas. Thank you, Kilian, and good afternoon to everybody who's listening. Um, well, um, the EDPS, as the European Data Protection Supervisor for the EU institutions, offices, bodies, and agencies, we, in principle, welcome this proposal. Um, because it's clearly based on a fundamental rights approach. But together with our colleagues from the European Data Protection Board, um, we have published a joint opinion where we ask and say we would like to see some more clarifications and refinements, in particular when it comes to the application of the GDPR and the other data protection rules. Um, some adjustment needs to be needed, for example, what's the relationship between a data protection supervisory authority in a member state and the other national supervisory authorities? Um, why is that important? Uh, Kilian, you asked for it. The enforcement will be key. And uh, enforcement comes with governance. And therefore, we believe we have important lessons to be learned from the governance and the enforcement of the GDPR. National data protection supervisory authorities as independent supervisory authorities have a great deal of expertise. Um, and we have seen that that is key and therefore they should, for example, be the national supervisory authorities. 
We in the EDP, EDPS, um, again, we welcome um, our specific role. Um, we have the technical expertise. Um, we have already a unit of technology experts. We're working very hard on our foresight capabilities and we're already dealing with aspects of AI and machine learning when it comes to EU institutions, etc. Of course, some of the proposals are new. That means there will be new tasks and extra work. And obviously that would need some more uh, resources uh, when it comes to human resources and budgetary resources. But I think um, that is doable. So uh, to cut a long story short, we need more clarification on certain points, uh, especially when it comes to the involvement of data protection authorities and single points of context are key for good governance and enforcement. Thank you. Kilian, the sentence of 21, yes. unmute yourself. Yeah. <laughs> no, thanks, Thomas, for the intervention. I wanted to be the best pupil in the class, so I muted myself <laughs> in order to avoid all background noises, and then I avoid, avoided even my own voice. But um, thanks a lot, Thomas. I think it's very good what you say, and it's very good that you refer as well to the joint opinion of the EDPS and the EDPB, which are very important, of course, a very important part of this of this process and provide a lot of uh, valuable insight to this, this discussion and will be um, a guiding document in the follow-up now in the further process. I would then turn to um, Aptim. Um, from your perspective, you're a not, you represent here a notified body. So the one really doing the check on the ground, checking the, uh, the system and would be in the future, if certified, then the, be the one to check the AI system. Given your experience in these uh, highly advanced technical fields like medical devices, software, cybersecurity, do you think uh, the enforcement mechanism and the way we, fo we foresee the involvement of the notified bodies under this new system is realistic, is useful, are there things which we need to improve or do you think we, we, um, this is more or less, did we get it right? Um, yes, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and Kilian, thank you for the interaction before and uh, thank you for inviting us here. Um, to, give the, to give a short answer to, to this very huge topic of AI, so I try to do it as short as possible. So uh, we see a global push of regulating AI all over the world, from US to, to smaller countries like, such as Singapore. And based on our opinions, the European risk-based approach is the way to go and is, according to my understanding, the most effective approach. It offers a robust regulatory framework, harmonized for all member states, and at the same time, it provides clarity for manufacturers, for notified bodies, and all other stakeholders. So everyone knows what he's going to deal or she is going to deal with and how to, uh, to comply with the requirements. However, from a notified body's point of view, in regards to the involvement as well as the enforcement acts, we see three challenges, which I would like to explain in three short comments. First, the current safety requirements are covered under the new legislative framework, NLF, and these are addressing sector-specific requirements. For instance, the medical requirements are covered under MDR. And for AI regulation, it is important to address those enforcements under the existing NLF framework First, to avoid defragmentation, and second, to avoid double work, and by this, increasing the cost and efficiency of the implementation for many factors as well as notified bodies, of course. And second, we suggest using existing authorization framework for notified bodies to expand the designation scope of, uh, of uh, notified bodies covering AI-related aspects, of course, under relevant NLF regulations. For instance, if a notified body has a designation under MDR, they would need to show uh, competency for assessing AI products. And third, and I think this is the most important aspect, we need harmonize standards or common specification to ensure that first notified bodies are able to implement a fair and even more important, a transparent conformity assessment process. And during that time, we do have, until we have the harmonized standards or common specification, until the day those uh, standards are published in official journal, notified bodies must then perform 
a high risk AI assessment under state of the art, which I will come to later on. But for this part, that's all I need or I have to uh, add to this topic. Thanks a lot. That is a good start. And we're looking forward to hearing more from you because I think, as you point out rightly, there's a lot, lot more to discuss on, on this and to go more into, into detail. But perhaps then we move one layer up and I could turn to, um, to Mariana from the Notifying Authority on Medical Devices in Portugal. Uh, you have as well a lot of experience in this field to overlook such a system and to certify these bodies who then do these, these checks. Um, how would you assess the role in this case of the notif so national authorities in the overall implementation and monitoring of such an act, uh, which are uh, mod modeled along the lines of the new legislative framework? So the idea that you can integrate, uh, that we will basically propose um, abstract standards, benchmarks, and then fill that out with industrial standards. So wh what do you think about this based on your experience? Hello. Firstly, good afternoon to all, and uh, thank you, Kilim, for the also for, for the introduction, the introduction, and for the, the invitation. Um, uh, I'm here in the role of the Competent Authority, uh, but also uh, my institution is also the, the the authority responsible for notifying bodies, and also the institution is uh, is has the competence for. Um, Medicine, cosmetic, and HTA, um, and in this scope, uh, I, I would like to say that uh, authorities for the moment are quite busy <laughs> with the implementation of the new regulation. But not only the authorities, Apkin, uh, as a notified body, is in, in the same way and as the other uh, uh, stakeholders. Um, this new regulation, indeed. Uh, was uh, is improving uh, the requirements with regard to to the new um, to the new technology uh, in particular to digital technologies they were the one of the main driver for for the regulation and uh, so the requirements were uh, improved in terms of safety security including data protection and uh, also performance new classification and uh, also uh, New, new provisions for notified bodies and uh, competent authorities and for all the ecosystem. Um, uh, so this aiming to reinforce uh, patient safety and, um, and health protection. Um, indeed, uh, the technology uh, also continue to, 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 uh, to develop, develop and uh, we have um, in place, so we have a new emergent technology working group that is um, um, dealing with uh, following the and identifying the new technology that can may impact the medical device legislation. And this is to say that, uh, in fact, we have a text that is more rich in requirements for software, but and it also prepare for. Uh, addressed innovation so we keep uh, following and uh, uh, try to to improve it and uh, uh, intelli uh, artificial intelligence is uh, one of the topic and the discussion at uh, we started the discussion recently to uh, around two years ago and last year we start also collaborating with international uh, regulate um, regulators um, forum and uh, in a new um, in an initiative uh, on AI so that uh, we can um, have let's say a start as a starting point a proposal with new definition and concepts for uh, uh, machine learning, uh, learning uh, enable medical device and uh, so I guess um, uh, from the perspective, uh, pers uh, perspective of the authority, we welcome this initiative, of course, because AI is not only, it's a global issue and uh, horizontal to the, not only to all the sectors. So uh, I'm glad that we uh, really uh, welcome an initiative that uh, in, um, bring um, also a uh, uh, horizontal approach for, for, for the technology. And... Uh, in, in our role on, on this, it's um, crucial. So we, we, we want to, it's good that it, the, the risk-based approach is uh, followed and uh, the authority is um, important so that um, uh, 
uh, the, the rules, the new rules or the proposed rules that will be applied as a new layer uh, to the to the new re requirements in the regulation will be uh, will be applied in an uh, uh, homogeneous way. So an enforcement is also uh, good to be, uh, let's say, uh, put in, in place uh, to, to guarantee this. One important issue that we see is that uh, the, the, the resources that so the authorities have to be uh, equipped with the, the resources needed to, to, to take this uh, to take uh, this activity uh, forward in terms of numbers and also uh, competencies. But this is something that uh, it's also important for the regulation of medical device uh, uh, that we have, uh, that we are already implementation, implementing. Um, and I guess um, uh, we will have to uh, guarantee also a good cooperation uh, with, the other, uh, with other authorities at national uh, and, uh, and the uh, European level. That will be uh, important, so to guarantee some uh, an harmonized approach, and also the, the uh, to 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 have more clear rules um, that the the rules are clear and apply uh, in this harmonized uh, way, and um, and this is also something that uh, applies not only for the market surveillance authority. So the market surveillance authority will uh, be. Uh, no, let's say uh, uh, the concern is focused on the products, but also the notifying authority, the concern is focused on notified bodies. So rules applicable uh, for the notified bodies and the products will be, uh, let's say, uh, put in uh, for by the, by the competent authorities. So uh, we have to have the... Uh, clarity uh, of this, uh, some clarity on, on, on these rules. But I guess this will be next step in the, in, in the process. Thanks Thank a lot, you. Isabel. Uh, thanks a lot, Marianne. And then I would now, it was very useful and very insightful. I perhaps would now like to turn to Isabel because you, we all do this for a purpose because the, um, the objective, we want to do this and we want, because one thing is, um, is it manageable and can we do this and will we, uh, with this, with this procedure work but of course the, the other question is will the procedure achieve its purpose meaning will it be sufficient to protect fundamental rights mm -hmm. what is your view there is the governance structure which we have suggested will that sufficiently ensure um, the protection of fundamental rights which we want to achieve with the re regulation thank you thank you very much Kiliana, and thank you for this very pertinent question um, as the uh, ETUC would like to stress, uh, of course, we welcome this uh, very important initiative, and I think it was expected already since a long time, uh, and it's clearly a step in the right direction. Now, what we also see is that it's a long run initiative, especially for industry. And unfortunately, as we see less for people and in particular for workers. And here, I think what we see um, is that the focus is really put on uh, product and services and the free movement of products and services in the internal market, uh, whereby we forget that uh, at the basis of uh, artificial intelligence is data and data of human beings and in particular of workers. And it's here where the issue of fundamental rights is key. And, and thank you for, for this for these questions. Uh, I think um, the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, which is legally binding for the European institutions and the member state, um, is clear here, should be the compass uh, to, um, you know, to develop this, uh, this, uh, this initiative. What we see also is that, uh, in principle, fundamental rights are not negotiable. Uh, and what we also see uh, in this, uh, uh, in this um, regulation is that there is a clear focus on certain fundamental rights, but not on all. And I think here we question um, this, this approach, where we understand that uh, there is a clear need to address uh, management by algorithm because of the potential discrimination that can lead um, by the use uh, of those uh, algorithms. We do not understand why uh, here a selection has been done, not taking into account the workers' dimension, the particular, the whole rights on information consultation and participation 
of the workforce through trade unions and workers' representative, which is part in principle of the governance of a well-functioning structure that delivers for all and not for certain. My question is also why we don't see here a role for the European Agency for Fundamental Rights. That would have been exactly um, a role to play here to make sure that fundamental rights are not just words uh, in a text of a regulations, but are um, uh, translated into concrete action. I could also um, criticize the risk assessment approach, um, and in particular because we understand very well that the high risk qualification should lead to safeguards. Now, when we look at the safeguards, um, we can question the effectiveness of those safeguards, uh, and some of them are quite weak in particular because they put the focus on the ex post um, uh, assessment and less on the ex ante, which is here, of course, uh, an issue. The issue of um, standardization has been put uh, uh, on the table. Uh, we are clearly here in the field of industry, of product, but we are clearly not in the field of uh, the impact of those products uh, and the use of it on human beings, uh, and I think this is exactly where I think standardizations has little to play and where regulations and existing protective uh, legislations has to be much more put uh, in the forefront. And when it comes to um, the um, role of uh, national authorities, we would have liked to see here the role, for example, of labor inspectors. Uh, we don't see it at all, and I think here, um, this is some of the um, missing dimension that this uh, regulation could have uh, addressed. Uh, and we hope that uh, in the uh, discussions, uh, debates taking place uh, until uh, the adoption of the final text, uh, this will find uh, its way into the, uh, the final uh, document. I will stop here for the first, first part of this discussion. Thanks, Isabel. Um... Of course, this discussion is going on. We have just submitted a proposal. We, we had a, a feedback exercise over the summer with more than 300 uh, submissions. And we are now discussing this in Parliament and Council. And therefore, all these contributions are very welcome because we are at the beginning of the discussion and not at the, at the end. Daniel, now we heard from Isabel that there is not enough protection of fundamental rights. I summarize mm -hmm. this very roughly. There was, it was much more yeah. and much more uh, detailed, of course. From your perspective, as a user or the of these of these um, systems, or the uh, the one of offering these systems, do you think that we have the right balance between ensuring protection of rights and compliance and not overburdening uh, the providers? Well, that's always a question uh, to ask um, the, the representation of uh, 360 entrepreneurs of AI um, in, in Germany, as we represent in the German AI Association. And I wouldn't see a big difference between what Isabel said and what I'm thinking, because I think um, we agree on the fundamental rights. And certainly, um, uh, worker protection has to be a very important part uh, of the AI regulation. But let me focus on, on another thing. I think that what we should discuss is fundamental rights, but how can we establish a functioning AI European ecosystem? How can we provide that Europe is not, let me say, too far behind of the big players as the US and China? And uh, does this regulation help um, to establish a functioning AI ecosystem? And we see many points that uh, we agree on, uh, which, um, which are uh, in the regulation or in the draft for the regulation. But of course, um, we see risk. For example, the German AI Association represents 360 entrepreneurs, and they are mostly startups and SMEs. We don't have any, and we don't want to have any uh, American or Chinese big tech uh, companies with us. We want to represent a, a German and a European uh, entrepreneurs in, in, with focus on AI. And there we see a little bit that the affordability, for example, of self and third party assessment, especially for startups and SMEs, um, in, in the point of risk assessment uh, can be too high. How can, let's be honest, any kind of regulation which will be drafted or, or um, then uh, after two to three years will uh, be published, um, the big techs will handle it. They have lawyers, they have law firms, they can handle it. But how can an SME 
or a startup in Slovenia, in Germany, in France, in Lithuania, can they handle the regulatory part on it? And I think there we should have a look at it, that how can um, we support startups? How can we support SMEs on, on, on the side that um, they are not overburdened uh, with regulations on there? I think then that the draft with risk assessment and, and um, you proposed, Kilian, uh, is going in the right direction. But I think that I'm a little afraid that especially after the whole parliamentarian process and stuff like that, um, there, there will be a disadvantages uh, for startups and SMEs. And please just um, to one final thought about the national regulation bodies and the supervising bodies and the people who are going then to the European bodies and regulating that. I really hope that this is not a reunion of lawyers only. I hope that in this um, assessment, there are real, um, 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 AI experts that, and I'm not meaning me that exactly as the German, I'm coming from journalism. I want to have in this regulating bodies, people who can understand and who do apply uh, AI in their work. And um, if this is only another lawyer conference, um, then I would say we should uh, think about um, how these bodies are structured. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Daniel. I will now not disclose that I'm a lawyer myself, but I don't have the intention to go into the <laughs> body. So, <laughs> um, you are very engaged and you're a fantastic panel, but you are not a short panel, if I may allow myself this a slightly critical remark, because we have exceeded already more than half of the time. And, um, and I would like to run a second round of questions and then go turn to the audience. So I would really have to cut you a little bit shorter even if I would love to listen more to you, but um, otherwise I, I don't make myself friends with those who come after me in the program. So I will now do the second round and I would really ask you to be uh, concise, just two or three thoughts and then pass it on so that everybody has a chance to, to speak. I would like again perhaps to kick off with Thomas. I said in the beginning, you have the experience from GDPR. What are the key lessons uh, learned? What shall we make, what shall we do this, uh, similar or why, why, why would you say we should do it differently? Just two or three thoughts. I know that's a long topic. Thanks, Kilian. Yeah, well, it's a million dollar question, I guess, but some thoughts. Already the GDPR was designed to be strong on enforcement. I think enforcement is key. And in the, at least in the area of data protection, you already have independent supervisory authorities who can do the enforcement and who have the technical expertise, lawyers and IT experts to do the enforcement. What we've seen from the GDPR is that um, there must be single points of contact. If you think of Germany, there are 18 German supervisory authorities on data protection, but they need to agree uh, amongst themselves who can speak for them in the European Data Protection Board. I think that is key. And I think for the AI regulation, we will see a much more enhanced need for supervisory authorities from across different sectors to talk to each other. I can't hear you. Because the, 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 the topics are more complex. So I think um, for the AI regulation, because of the expertise of data protection supervisory authorities, we would recommend the deep data protection authorities are the um, NSAs. And we see that um, then you can have strong enforcement like we have seen with the WhatsApp case in Ireland where they were fined 225 million euros for non-compliance with the law. There's more okay. to say, but maybe later. Thank you. Okay, thanks Thomas. That was exactly what I wanted, spicy and sharp. You call for the um, DPA should become the national supervisory authorities and sufficient equipment. Let's speak about lessons learned. Mariana, what is your lesson learned from assessing software compliance and AI, uh, which is complex already? Are there something which you really would like to give us on this way in the further negotiations, what we need to take into account? I guess uh, two, uh, two things. One related to the economic operators, so the, the manufacturers and, uh, and uh, Daniel already spoke about startups and SMEs that uh, are really the, the main, the main uh, uh, economic op operators in the in the in the, the the field of software and maybe specifically AI. But uh, I guess uh, from our experience, it's quite important that uh, uh, 
we we have um, a close um, collabor authorities have a close collaboration, not a close uh, let, let's say close work with the academy and also with this uh, sector. I mean, we have to 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 pay attention to this. Um, um, let's say it's a, a new industry to the medical device sector. So uh, we have to inform them about regulation and as as, so, as early as possible. Uh, so that's important that we um, include the, in, in, uh, in the environment uh, as a stakeholder, also the academy and also this uh, new industry so that we focus our campaigns uh, uh, and um, awareness sessions um, so that they are aware of, of that. And as early they have aware of the regulation, a better product we will have uh, in the market. So this is one side. Another uh, issue that we have, as you know, uh, we uh, regulation, medical device regulation, uh, regulate software if they are medical device uh, and uh, um, is applicable to all kinds of software. We don't have a specific uh, requirements for AI. So, um, and uh, for, for the, uh, having in mind the experience that we have so far, um, it is important to have the, 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 the clear rules so that uh, we don't have, uh, it is, we have, um, we avoid issues with the um, not, uh, in the classification of the, the products, and also with the qualification, because is the main uh, issues that we find in, in the in the in the sector, and also um, clinical evaluation, which is also something that uh, um, it, we have to uh, improve uh, more. Um, in fact, I guess um, um, it is also important. We see that the, the definition uh, anticipated is also um, uh, maybe will cover will be it's so broad that maybe uh, we'll have um, let's say uh, less clarity so what it will be a software ai software or not maybe m most of them will follow in, in the definition so it's, it's something that we have to to see in the future so okay. clear rules to to the future thanks a lot aptin we spoke about the, the checks what about the requirements? Do you think the requirements we have suggested can be well assessed by the notified bodies? A short answer would be appreciated. What do you think? Will the TÜV be able, or others alike, of course not only the TÜV, but will be the notified bodies we have, be able to do uh, to check them in a meaningful way uh, to make really sure that the products are trustworthy? You're muted. Yeah, I did the same mistake. <laughs> yeah, let me quickly answer that question. Yes, we we are already building up the resources to be able to to perform the assessment according to to the draft requirements in the AI regulation. And the challenge that I only see currently is to attract the technical expert to be able to to evaluate the mass of uh, products that might come to us as a notified body. And we already are evaluating AI aspects in medical devices, not only medical devices, but I can only talk from the medical point of view. Uh, and we are already checking for explainability of the system since we are already seeing incidences in the market with black box AI systems. We look at the configuration management for data. We look for the quality of data and statistical distribution of data in context of bias, risk management and training uh, of personal involved in AI assessment, also labeling if it's applicable to the model. And also we check the post-market activities for manufacturers. Thanks. That was exactly what I wanted, short and, and very clear. Isabel, we turn to you. You mentioned you think we have not sufficiently covered uh, the, the world of labor in, in the regulation. If we look at Annex um, 3, we have um, quite a number of use cases in the area of employment. If you, if, you, if you ask you the precise question, what do you think is exactly missing from these use cases? What kind of use case would we need to add in the former discussion? I think what, what is missing is the specificity of the workplace. The workplace is, is, is a place where, of course, you have a very unbalanced relationship between on one side the employers, on the other side the workers. And this is the reasons why workers' representative and trade unions are very active. So this collective dimension in terms of covenant, but also in terms of 
uh, being informed and consulted on the introduction of AI at the workplace is missing, for example. We have to rebuild the trust. And I think this is also where AI could play a role. And this is the whole dimension of ethics. Ethics cannot be relegated to guidelines. I'm afraid to say that, but it's not enough. Uh, and I think here uh, we need to have clear uh, ethical uh, regulations where this uh, ethical dimension is also applied to the employers. And of course, uh, here this dimension is to secure fair competition between uh, different businesses so that not to use uh, this dimension and to make labor a commodity at the end of the day. And my suggestions would be indeed uh, to have an ethical commission could be also part of the European uh, Artificial Intelligence Board. But I think an ethical commission that would have a say and potentially a veto would be very good, where, of course, uh, the workplace dimension should be represented properly uh, and not by a set of experts, uh, which here uh, I'm afraid also to say is one of the concerns we see to be relegated as a level of uh, uh, experts, whereby here we understand that it is very important to take uh, the expertise uh, uh, of the workers' representative and uh, the employers uh, at specific uh, level. Um, I think we do need to have a specific uh, legislation, European legislation on artificial intelligence uh, apply and introduce and apply uh, at the workplace. And it was uh, discussed about uh, the risk of overregulation. I would here speak uh, of the risk of deregulation in case uh, the AI uh, regulation would prevail over more protective legislation. Uh, this would be uh, very detrimental to the workers, to the businesses, and in particular, uh, it would put uh, kind of very uncomfortable situations for the producers, for example, for the providers uh, on one side uh, to respect uh, labor law, uh, for example, and uh, on the other side uh, to be competitive on the market. And I think this is exactly the reasons why we need to have innovations, but not innovations at any price. And I think here, when we know the risk, we have to make sure that we can address it if we cannot. And most of the time there is here uh, an unknown dimensions. We have to use the precautionary principle, which is anchored in the European treaties. Thanks a lot, Isabel. Daniel, what would all this mean? A lot of innovation comes from very small companies, from startups yeah. who have not a lot of experience with um, regulatory processes. Yeah. You mentioned this already in your first remark. This may be a compliance cost for big companies. This may be a hurdle for small ones. Do you yeah. think what we foresee in the regulation is feasible for small scale providers? Do we have, uh, or do you think they would basically turn their back to AI and think then uh, if this is so complicated, we better do something else? Well, that's a good question. And um, watching into the, what's the word in English, Kristallkugel, um, in, into the future, yeah, uh, that would be also um, very interesting. It is, the, the problem I think is that, um, that we don't know yet. We don't know yet. Uh, we don't know which kind of regulation will come out after uh, 24 months uh, parliamentary and, and, and subcommittee uh, and uh, what will be the final, the final draft? I can't tell you. At, we, we ask our members about your draft that uh, you, you provided there. And uh, we arranged a task force and over 60 to 70 members came in and discussed um, um, uh, your proposal there and, or your draft of the regulation. And I think um, the questions um, which came uh, quite often were, who bears the liability risk for incidents in the testing process? How are systematic biases resulting out of systematic testing prevented? And how are transparency and access to the review process guaranteed, especially for startups and SMEs? And what are the requirements for the classification of the reviewers? So who is reviewing that? What are their qualifications on that? That would be um, uh, also, I'm not making any more puns about lawyers, uh, but uh, this uh, should be addressed and um, that, that, that experts are there. And as, as, as much I, I am also um, uh, quite um, a strong um, um, advocate for, for strong data protection, uh, only data protection as a feasible um, uh, thing there is, is not enough. There has to be uh, other ways um, of um, explaining and um, 
getting um, the knowledge of AI developers into this procedure and also into these national governing boards and stuff like that. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I'm just informed we have nine minutes left and I would like to take at least a few questions from the audience. I think the closing questions we will not really manage, but it's better to have a, li a lively discussion than uh, the other way around. And I think uh, you all contributed a lot to very interesting thoughts. Aptin. I need then as well to be short myself. How to cope with the worrying lack of expert capacity and the, uh, the slow speed of standard development is a question from the audience to you, please. You I again it. muted myself, yeah, as always. <laughs> um, I think this is one of the most important questions in this context, which uh, Danielle has very often uh, referred to. We do see, even in the industry, where, uh, where usually the AI experts tend to go, have difficulties to get those experts. And those experts are most of the time going to the big players and do not tend to go to the small or medium-sized company. So uh, what, uh, and when it comes to notified bodies, well, we are, uh, we are, I would say a level below that because uh, here we do not develop an AI system, we evaluate an AI system. And most of the case, those AI experts um, misunderstand what we are doing. So it is very difficult also for us to get um, those experts. And when it comes to the uh, um, competent authorities, I don't know the situation there, but I guess it's not different there. So what we need is in Europe, I would say we need a strong, educational approach from a EU commission, from the regulators to, to, to create, create those experts. And currently we, we do see this as a huge challenge. Well, let me quickly say one word to the standardization situation. Mm -hmm. The standardization situation is not major currently. So, and that might lead to defragmentation of how the notified bodies are assessing uh, uh, the AI system in the market, because if there is no standard, notified bodies look into the state of the art, and that state of the art is really a question of uh, understanding. And um, that might differentiate from uh, uh, country to country and also from notified body to notified. So we need uh, standards and common specification or guidance from regulators. This is the three levels of knowledge we are we are taking into consideration, and they are missing. And however, the standardization is going on so the harmonization is seems to be working in the future and there are a lot of standards coming so there i do not have any doubts the only challenge the major challenge i see are the experts we need an expert in all of the uh, uh stakeholder levels from regulator to to the uh industry to the uh to the tech industry Thanks a lot. Very clear. So standards are not your ma major concern, but you, you're worried about the lack of experts. Isabel, there's a question to you um, about the dis we distinguish between high risk and, and specific risk, but we don't have what, what the um, audience here asked, average risk. Do you think there's a potential gap for consumer level AI in the risk-based approach? So do we need a more nuanced approach to cover all different risks? Uh, I suppose, indeed, uh, I think we can't have a one solution that would fit all. And it's exactly what I was saying today. Um, artificial intelligence uh, cannot be the bullet, the silver bullet for, for everything. And I think we have clearly to see that at the end of the day, the users are human beings and the users might use this artificial intelligence, for example, at the workplace. Uh, and this use will have adverse impact on other human beings. And here I do speak about the workers. Um, and I, of course, we have also this consumer dimension. And here I, I, I really much plead for a very differentiated approach while respecting existing protections. Uh, and uh, we speak about the, the consumer approach. I think we should also speak about the environment where the issue of the principle, uh, precautionary principle comes from. And it's now today uh, applic uh, applied to, to a large range uh, of issues. And here I would like just to come back to this uh, adverse effect uh, on human beings at the workplace. Uh, AI can lead uh, uh, indeed to, to invasive work surveillance to behavioral profiling, to geo-tracking, uh, also to uh, reputational scoring 
at the workplace to uh, human verifications in terms of processes and performances in terms of uh, the decomposition of the task into micro tasks, which are distributed by, uh, uh, by an algorithm. And at the end, what we've seen in some businesses is hiring and firing by a machine. And this is not acceptable. And this is why the AI regulation should uh, be put in place, but please with a specific uh, dimension, uh, looking at uh, the workplace dimension. And we all know that there is an issue of the legal base and the competencies. So please let DG employment uh, in, uh, use and, and, and take this, this, this issue on board uh, and not trying to regulate everything at the workplace by standardizations and experts groups where we do not see where this very balanced social partner approach on one side, businesses on the other side, trade unions can discuss the workplace the way the industrial relations systems are built. So here again, no respect of the existing situations, no respect of the industrial relations system, which is the foundation in Europe of all the member states, no respect of the minimum standards for labor law. So I think here there is a, a real need to move on to AI at the workplace and, and leave the space for, uh, I would say, the practitioners uh, of, uh, of this issue. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Isabel. The Commission is as well working on platform workers, so there are other initiatives as well, but we don't touch on this. This is not a topic for today. You can't, you can't reduce artificial intelligence to platform work, no platform work to no, no, artificial I intelligence. <laughs> Okay, thanks a lot. I think we have uh, finally exhausted a bit our time. That's why we need to um, to come to an end because uh, we have a strict timetable for today. I thank you very, very much. I think we, uh, I at least, I learned a lot uh, from the different perspectives, from the particular experience we had with the data protection regulation, from the work on the ground in the notified bodies, as well from the perspective of the national um, the national authorities supervising very advanced systems. So thanks for this, Mariana. From Daniel, for your insight, what you think about uh, the companies who would be subject to these um, assessment, and of course from you, Isabel, on the potential gaps and deficits the system may have in order to achieve fully its function to protect um, fundamental rights, which is the underlying objective of this. So thanks all to all of you for your valuable contributions. Just to remind you, we have now a five minute break, but then you should turn back, of course, to the, um, to the, uh, to the conference. We will have a short wrap up by the, uh, the main moderator where we will now report back to the, um, to the moderator on the results of the different sessions. So that should be in, in, like a hangover or an incentive to come back and to, uh, in, in, to uh, join the conference. From my side, a big thank you. I hope we can continue this discussion at another um, occasion. And I wish you all a great day and I hope you will enjoy uh, the rest of the conference. Thanks a lot and hope to see and speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Bye-bye, thank, thank you. Bye. Thank you, bye-bye.